Path of Radiance was the first game in the Fire Emblem series that I played. And while some of its issues bother me more today than they did when I was a teenager, I would be lying if I said I didn't have some amount of nostalgia for the land of Tellius. Since for Pride Month I'm exclusively making videos on LGBTQ content, I was tempted to make one about Ike, the main lord of Path of Radiance, who is commonly believed to be either gay or asexual. But Captain Astronaut already made a video about Ike's queerness, and anything that I have to say would probably just be derivative of what he said. I thought about doing a unit analysis of Ike, but to be honest, Path of Radiance Ike is a pretty boring unit. I've previously described him as Roy without any of the upsides, but I think a more accurate description would be Roy without any of the interesting parts. He's kind of just a foot-locked, sword-locked dude in a world where you don't want to be either of those, and there's not much more to him than that. So instead, I decided to look at his potential boyfriends, Soren and Renolf. Renolf is, much like Ike, pretty boring as a unit, but Soren is someone who I've actually wanted to talk about for a few months appearing as one of the options on my Patreon's unit analysis polls. In April, Actual Lizard did a video on Soren as a unit, so I sort of shelved my idea for a while because I didn't want it to come off as a response video. But it's Pride Month, I want to talk about a gay boy, and Lizard said he wouldn't be offended, so let's talk about why I don't think Soren is a particularly good unit in Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. In this video, I will be focusing on the hard difficulty, which was the highest difficulty available in the American version of the game. This is typically the difficulty I talk about when evaluating units in Path of Radiance for a variety of reasons. The first is simply familiarity. I've only beaten Maniac Mode three times, whereas I've played Path of Radiance hard enough to transfer the entire support log to Radiant Dawn. I've lost track of the total number of playthroughs, but that's over 10 times as many as Maniac Mode at least. The second is there's simply more easily accessible information about hard mode. With a Serenus Forest post that documents the average stats of every single enemy in the game on hard mode. Such a resource does not exist for Maniac Mode, and I don't feel like making one myself. Thirdly, I don't think that Maniac Mode is actually significantly harder than hard mode once you get outside of the early game. It adds on to Path of Radiance's tendency to spam maps with hordes of enemies, and while the enemies are stronger, they're not so strong that your usual top tiers are going to be suffering. Instead, the biggest changes are a larger number of enemies and a huge number of siege tomes and status staffs once you enter the second half of the game. As a result, I think that it ends up just more tedious instead of more difficult, and it's a difficulty that I don't really find enjoyable. And I don't think I'm the only one. Despite the fact that most people use Nintendo PC in order to play Path of Radiance, the most popular difficulty by far is hard mode, at least among English-speaking audiences. Part of this probably comes down to the extra steps of getting a Japanese ROM and patching a translation onto it, but it's worth noting that at least from what I've read online, Japanese audiences weren't a fan of Maniac Mode either, which seems to have been the primary motivation for removing it in the international release. It's just not a particularly well-designed difficulty. Which brings me to the final reason that I usually focus on hard mode when talking about Path of Radiance, and that's that I want my videos to actually be helpful to people. If the majority of my audience has not played Path of Radiance on Maniac Mode and never will, then talking about Soren as a unit on Maniac Mode is likely to be uninteresting to them. With all that preamble out of the way, I will be focusing on Hard Mode for this playthrough, but I will mention the instances in which Maniac Mode makes a significant difference for Soren's performance. If you have a problem with that approach, then, I don't know, leave a comment about how I'm a cowardly fake gamer for not exclusively focusing on the masochism mode. One last bit of preamble, and then I promise we can start talking about Soren specifically. But I do think it's important to take a look at the system-wide changes that Path of Radiance made to the Mage class, most of which were nerfs, which makes sense considering that mages were pretty overpowered in Thracia and two out of three GBA games. It turns out that perpetual access to 1-2 range that hits on an enemy's weaker defensive stat is pretty strong, and so when you give them staff utility on top of that, you get some of the best units of all time. And even the units that aren't as strong as Pent and Asvel tend to be pretty good just by virtue of being in the mage class. The first way that Path of Radiance nerfed mages was by attacking their weapon type. Tomes are still 1-2 range, but they are significantly lower might than they used to be. 
and more importantly, significantly lower might than physical weapons. The strongest magic type, Thunder, is only 4 might compared to the weakest physical type, Sword, at 5. This gets even more laughable when considering that one of the draws of magic was supposed to be it deals effective damage. The basic Wind Tome has 2 might, which means even if you're hitting a flyer with it, that is a 4 might weapon. Fire goes from 3 to 6, and Thunder goes from 4 to 8, which would be respectable were it not for the fact that it only deals effective damage to dragons, which are present on like 3 maps total. But it's not just mages' weapons that were nerfed. The class itself suffers from armored movement, meaning that they will lag behind even your other infantry unless you shove or rescue drop them to keep up. Additionally, instead of always getting staffs on promotion, mages get the option between knives and staffs. While this may seem like a buff, it is secretly a nerf in disguise. Knives are basically useless because they scale off of strength and mages don't have very good strength stats, so a reasonable person will always choose staves as their promotion weapon. Knives instead exist to make your two pre-promoted sages, Khalil and Bastion, lack staff access, thus limiting their utility to only doing combat. Not all of the changes to the mage class were bad, some were basically neutral. Where in GBA Anima was a single tree, here Wind, Fire, and Thunder have all been split up, much like they were in Genealogy and Thracia. Mages now have three separate ranks to keep up with, which can make it difficult to use high level magic in all three schools, but you don't really need to use high level magic in all three schools. You're usually fine just sticking with a single school of magic, training that one, and using the high level tomes from that school. All three schools have basically identical weapons. An iron equivalent, a steel equivalent, a siege tome, and a silver equivalent. Theoretically, if you train yourself to C tier in multiple schools, you can gain access to multiple siege tomes, which can be beneficial because you do get a copy of each flavor of siege tome. But it's worth noting that while this is by no means impossible, you are probably going to have to plan out your tome usage in order to achieve multiple C ranks. At least they didn't lock the Siege Tomes to A rank like they did in Thracia. There are two more aspects of Path of Radiance that really work against mages. The first is the forging system. Once per map, you can forge a weapon to give it a bunch of extra stats. You have to spend a not insignificant amount of gold on this, and the amount of gold that you spend depends on the weapon's base stats as well as what stats you are trying to get it to go into. Because Tomes have such low base might, any amount of might added to them is going to cost more than might added to physical weapons, because it is considered to be multiplicatively higher than the tome's base might. It's a slightly more complicated system than I'm making it out to be, but basically tomes are way more expensive than physical weapons. Additionally, while you can forge multiple tiers of physical weapons, from iron, steel, silver, and even throwables, you can only ever forge the lowest tier of each type of magic, that being fire, wind, thunder, and light. Ultimately, this is really only a big deal in the early game. Gold is pretty plentiful in Path of Radiance starting in the mid game, so you probably have enough to forge everything. But the existence of forges does also make physical units 1-2 range access much better, because once you start being able to forge throwables, you're just going to be able to create really, really good 1-2 range units, regardless of whether or not they're hitting on resistance. And speaking of hitting on resistance, that is the other major nerf to mages. Enemies now have decent resistance stats. Resistance is still typically lower than defense, but not by such a significant margin that you are going to feel like you are hitting on their weak point. On average, enemies will have between 3-5 resistance less than defense. This doesn't hold true for all classes. Armor Knights have a much bigger gap, and mages will have more resistance than defense. But in general, the run of the mill soldiers will have somewhere between 3 and 5 resistance, less than defense. You might have noticed that this is barely enough to make up for the difference in weapon might. This doesn't mean it's impossible for a mage to be a good unit, just that they are fighting an uphill battle. And now, we can finally talk about the Twink. Soren joins in Chapter 4, and the game seems to be going out of its way to give him a bad first impression. Soren's stats are quite bad, even for the early game. 18 HP and 2 defense means he gets 2 rounded by almost every enemy on the map, 
and you start out with quite a few enemies around your group. So many that in order for Sorin to avoid dying, he kind of has to hide behind other people on turn 1. He has a speed of 8, but because he has 0 strength, he gets weighed down by 1, so his effective speed is 7, meaning that there's actually quite a few enemies on his join map that this fast mage boy does not even double. And while most units start with random biorhythm, Sorin actually defaults to having the worst biorhythm as his starting point, which isn't a huge deal, but does kind of rub in the fact that the game really, really wants to give him a bad first impression. It's not all terrible. He has six base magic, which is the same amount of strength that Oscar has and one more than Ike. Unfortunately, his damage output appears to be much lower due to the fact he comes with the Wind Tome equipped, which is the weakest weapon in all of Path of Radiance. And you won't gain access to another magic spell for him until near the end of Chapter 7, where there is a droppable Fire Tome. In part, this is due to the fact that Soren is this game's Wind Specialist. He has D rank in Wind and E in both other magic types. But you should ignore this and have Soren use Thunder and Fire at almost every available point. Not only because these tomes are better, but because their Siege Tomes come earlier than Blizzard. Soren's early game is mostly pretty tragic. Chapter 4, he's not going to be doing much of worth, but in Chapter 5, you could theoretically train him since you have 6 turns to defend with no way to shorten the defend timer. He is much too frail to handle more than one enemy on enemy phase, so you're probably going to be getting him 6 or 7 kills at most, consigning most of his combat to the player phase. That being said, it's not like his growths are terrible. He has a 60% magic growth, which is quite good, and 40% speed isn't exactly the speed demon you would expect a wind mage to be, but it is respectable enough. If you really want to favoritism him, there is a Seraph Rope available in Chapter 1 you can save for him, and that probably lets him fight two enemies on enemy phase, upping the amount of experience he can get, but I think that it is a stretch to say that he is the best user of the Seraph Rope. Chapters 6 and 7 are the last maps before you gain access to the pace, which I consider to be the end of the very early game. Here there are a couple of armor knights, which Soren could theoretically leverage the low resistance of. However, you get a hammer in Chapter 5, so Boyd and Titania are actually better suited to take on the armor knights than Soren is, since Soren does not even one-round them, despite the fact that they have terrible resistance. This is the curse of the Wind Tome. I mean, forget the hammer. Hilariously, I find that if Boyd gets the speed to double, he deals more damage with the Steel Axe than Soren does with the Wind Tome. And that's without even considering Titania, the game's ridiculously overtuned Jagan. I mean, she's better than everyone in the cast, so it's not too fair to hold that against Soren, but still, it is worth noting that, like, you have other options to kill Armor Knights that aren't just Soren. Regal Sword Ike, who I don't think is a particularly good unit, is much better at dealing with the Armor Knights than Soren is. It's also worth noting that chapters 4, 6, and 7 are all fairly movement intensive maps. Soren only has one less move than Ike and Boyd, but he has three less move than Oscar and four less move than Titania. And for the maps where he's available, Shannon also has a plus two move advantage on Soren. This might not seem like a lot, but over the course of a big map, it adds up quickly. And as we get deeper into the game, the maps are only going to get larger, meaning that Soren will have to adapt or get left behind. For anyone who is wondering how Maniac Mode affects Soren's very early game, there are both upsides and downsides. The first downside is incredibly obvious. Stronger enemies means that Soren can no longer survive a round of combat from every enemy. In fact, most enemies will one round him. This makes his early game training arc much harder because you can't really rely on enemy phase combat, whether it be for kills or for chip. That being said, there is the argument that his early game contributions are more useful in Maniac Mode. In Hard Mode, it's kind of just the Titania show, but in Maniac Mode, you really need everyone to contribute. Much like in games like FE6 and Lunatic Awakening, being able to chip from two range becomes valuable if everyone doesn't like getting retaliated against. That being said, his damage output is kind of pathetic on hard, and it gets worse on Maniac. 
you kind of can't rely on him doubling without you proccing Adept. It's also worth noting that the Chapter 6 and 7 Armor Knights are now much more difficult to deal with. Titania can't double with the hammer unless she gets speed level ups and uses the speed wings. Additionally, their defense is high enough that the Steel Axe is no longer a makeshift answer. Sorin hitting on resistance is genuinely useful here, but I find that he tends to suffer from what I refer to as Walt Syndrome. That being, he's really useful at chipping, but he fails to secure kills particularly often, and as a result ends up lower level than the rest of your squad. Of course, this isn't a huge deal in Path of Radiance because of the mechanic we're about to discuss. Bonus experience! So, bonus experience is, in my opinion, one of the worst mechanics Fire Emblem has ever implemented, but we really can't ignore its existence when evaluating units. In general, it is ideal to dump large amounts of bonus experience onto single units in order to create overpowered demigods who can wreck the rest of the game and Chapter 8 Preps is the first opportunity to do so. On hard mode, if you completed every single early map in its minimum number of turns, you'll have 1500 bonus experience, with 10 more BXP for every extra unit that escaped in Chapter 6. 10 bonus experience is chump change, so for our purposes, I'm going to assume the number 1500. This is approximately 12 levels of bonus experience, although it's not an exact science because lower levels take less bonus experience and higher levels take more bonus experience. An unpromoted level 6 unit can use 1500 BXP to get to level 18, however, and a level 7 unit can use the same bonus experience to reach level 19. These numbers are relevant for our discussion because I've found that upon hyper training Soren, he typically ends up around level 6 or 7 when you enter the first base. As such, if you decide to dump all of your bonus experience into him, then you end up with a unit around level 18, 19, or 20 if you had really doubled down on the investment early game. If we take a look at Soren's level 19 averages, they are, well, they're not super impressive. 26 HP and 4 defense isn't exactly what I would call bulky, although to be fair, you don't expect much bulk out of a mage. His offensive stats are between 16 and 17 magic, and between 15 and 16 speed. Although, it's worth noting that with only one point of strength, his AS will be closer to 12 or 13 depending on what weapon he uses. That being said, 12 AS is actually enough to double every single enemy in Chapter 8, with the exception of the unarmed priests, but like, they're not a huge threshold. You, you don't really need to care about doubling and killing them. And 16 magic is enough that if you're doubling, you're probably killing. But I didn't invest all this bonus experience just to snipe people on player phase. How does Soren's bulk compare to the Chapter 8 enemies? With 16 resistance, I think we can safely ignore all of the magical enemies, and instead focus only on the physical ones, since 4 defense is a much more pathetic number. If you did not give Soren the Angelic Rope, then he gets 3 rounded by most enemies on the map, although the Steel Blade Myrmidons, Steel Lance Knights, and Steel Lance Soldiers, as well as the boss, will 2 round him. If you gave him the Angelic Robe, then the Steel Blade, Myrmidon, Steel Lance Knight, and Steel Lance Soldiers will 3-round him, the boss of the map will still 2-round him, and every other enemy will 4-round him. Well, except for the mages, which will continue to deal no damage. If you think this sounds like a pretty terrible bulk situation for a unit you dumped all of your bonus experience onto, I agree, although it is worth noting that it is not quite as bad as it sounds. Before factoring in terrain and biorhythm, Soren has 34 avoid with fire tome equipped. If we look specifically at the enemies who two round Soren, he actually has a pretty decent chance of avoiding them. The Steel Lance Knights only have 79 hit, which is reduced to 45 when factoring in Soren's avoid. The Steel Blade Myrmidon, on the other hand, has 97 hit, and 64 is, in my opinion, too high a number to rely on dodging. I mean, I tend not to be a fan of dodging even the 45s, but I thought I would bring it up because dodge tanking is one of the ways in which Soren tends to supplement his bulk going forward. Especially since, after leaving Chapter 8, we can start building his support with Ike. Ike has a lot of support options, but if you're using Soren, then I genuinely think Soren is the best pairing for him, and not just because I support gay lovers. 
If you're going to have Sorin enemy face, which you probably want him to do, then Sorin pretty desperately needs that Earth support to add to his survivability. Titania and Oscar are better units than Sorin, but they also don't need the support from Ike as badly. And moreover, both of them are cavalry, which means that they're often going to end up in situations where they rush ahead to the front lines while Ike lags behind with the rest of the infantry. It's for this reason that I prefer pairing Oscar with either Kieran or Tanith, since both of them keep pace with him no matter what the map objective is. Titania doesn't really have any better options than Ike, but also, she doesn't really need the support, like Titania is pretty good on her own. The one downside to the Ike Soren support is it is very slow. You get the C support at the earliest in Chapter 9, and then the next support you have available is B at the earliest, Chapter 16. And if you deploy Soren in every single map, then the A support will not be available until Chapter 23. This is notable because the benefits of the lower levels of the Ike Soren support are actually not great. For those first seven chapters, Soren will only be getting plus 10 avoid and plus 1 attack from his Ike support. And even once you get a B support, it's only plus 20 avoid plus 1 attack. The C support gives 2 attack and 30 avoid, but this comes so late. It is also worth noting that to get the full effects of the support, Sorn needs to be within 3 tiles of Ike, and once we enter the mid game, enemies start having a lot of 1 2 range. Since Ike is locked to 1 range until the last 2 chapters of the game, 1 2 range enemies are going to prioritize attacking Ike, who can't counter them, instead of Sorin, who can. On some maps, it is definitely possible to position Sorin in a way that he fights a bunch of enemies while Ike is in support range and doesn't fight any, but on some of the other maps that are more wide open fields, this becomes a difficult to impossible task. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's look at how the plus 10 avoid affects Sorin's chances in Chapter 9. After all, this portion of the game is where he is at his strongest. He's overleveled beyond all belief and yet he still gets too rounded by Steel Axe fighters. Now, if we assume that Soren promoted by Chapter 9, then his base of Void holding a Fire Tome is 44, and if he's an Ike support range, then it becomes 54. The Steel Axe pirates have between 79 and 82 hit, which means that even without Ike support, they're going to be facing sub-40 hit rates on Soren. And with the Ike support, then it's sub-30. And if Soren has even one more point of defense or HP than average, then they go from a 2-shot to a 3-shot. So yeah, despite the way that he looks frail on paper, hyper-trained and promoted Soren is not actually in any amount of significant danger from the Chapter 9 enemies. Hi, this is Editing Danny, inserting something that I forgot to touch on in the initial recording. While Soren does have very good avoid against the various Axe enemies, in chapters 9 through 15-ish, against the Steel Sword and Steel Lance enemies, he is commonly facing around a 50% hit rate. Because these enemies 2 or 3 round him, if he loses a couple of coin tosses, Soren can end up dead, and in a game that emphasizes enemy phase as much as Path of Radiance, I would say that that's a pretty bad place to be combat-wise. Personally, I found an unbonus experienced Oscar to be doing more reliable combat than my super bonus experienced Soren, which is pretty damning. And this maintains for a little bit actually. If we skip ahead to chapter 13, a level 2 or 3 Sage Soren is still getting 4 or 5 rounded by enemies, and that's before factoring in his avoid. Yeah, their hit rates are higher, but it can still be assumed that Storin dodges some amount of attacks at this point in the game. Once we reach Chapter 17 and beyond, promoted units start showing up and Soren can struggle against those, but he's still been quite good for a significant portion of the game. So that's it. Case closed. Soren is actually a good unit, and I'm a liar and a hack and a fraud, right? Well, not so fast. I would posit that it is less Soren doing the work here and more the bonus experience. After all, any other unit who you feed that much PXP into will have a similar or perhaps even better performance compared to Soren's. If we don't want to give Soren any bonus experience in Chapter 8, then there are a couple of other contenders for the big dump. Chief among them is Oscar, due to his status as the game's early game cavalier. Now, Oscar is a unit that gets a lot of, in my opinion, undeserved hate. 
It feels similar to Franz, where there was a backlash to him being rated as high as he was, but the backlash has gone too far, and now he is underrated. If we have decided that Oscar is our project unit, then let's assume that we feed him an equal amount to Soren in the early game. Personally, I find it easier to feed Oscar than Soren in the first seven chapters, and so usually he's at a higher level than Soren by the time I reach chapter eight. But for the sake of argument, let's pretend that both of them are only at level seven when we're deciding who to give bonus experience to. A level 19 Oscar has 34 HP and 13 defense, meaning that he will be significantly bulkier than a level 19 Soren. Offensively, his stats are admittedly less impressive, with 13 strength and 14 speed. Although it is worth noting that 13 strength is enough to avoid being weighed down by steel lances, so he's going to have 14 AS at all times. This means that Oscar will double the same enemies that Soren does, i.e. all of them. Oscar with a Steel Lance has 25 attack as compared to Soren with Fire Tome having only 19. Even if we factor in the difference between enemy defense and res, Oscar is actually dealing more damage, but he lacks 1-2 range. If he uses a Javelin, he has 19 attack, which means that he's dealing less damage than Soren because he hits on defense. This is actually enough to stop him from hitting some one-rounding thresholds in Chapter 9, but only with the Javelin, and I would argue that Kanto gives him enough flexibility to make up for this detriment. In less movement-intensive maps like Chapter 8, Oscar can still Kanto between choke points, killing someone at the leftmost choke point and then Kantoing to hold the center one. And once we move on to movement-intensive maps like Chapters 11, 13, and 14, Oscar's significant move advantage is going to make him much better at accomplishing both main and side objectives than Soren is. But maybe it's unfair comparing the armor movement mage to our early game Cav. So instead, I want to look at the performance of Mia if you give her the early game bonus experience dump, since Mia is commonly considered to be one of the worst units in Path of Radiance. As a level 1 Swordmaster, Mia has nearly twice the average defense of a level 1 Sage Soren. They have equivalent HP, which means that Mia just is able to take more punishment than Soren. And even if we factor in the support from Ike, she has more avoid than Soren will have on average. With 13 strength and a steel sword, Mia is also able to one round a surprisingly high number of enemies. Now, she does suffer quite a bit from being locked to one range, and she won't one round every single enemy, so Soren is definitely a better bonus experience target than Mia, but the point I'm making is that bonus experiencing someone in the early game can make just about any unit good. And admittedly, throughout Path of Radiance, there are a number of instances to BXP your favorite units. The prison map gives you 700 for going stealth, and Chapter 9 gives you 300 for finishing within the minimum number of turns. That means that shortly after the Chapter 8 bonus experience, we have another 1,000 to give away. And this pattern remains consistent, with between 100 and 300 being given in every chapter. So approximately every four chapters, you can BXP dump someone. But Path of Radiance hands you powerful candidates for the BXP dump even more quickly than it hands you BXP. Marsha joins just before the prison map, and she really wants some bonus experience so that you can get a very strong flyer. Jill, Kieran, and even Makalov are competent mounted units who you can choose to invest in to make them into potential carries. And Astrid has Paragon, meaning that she gets double duty out of the bonus experience you give her. And the later we get into the game, the less impactful a bonus experience dump on a unit like Soren will be. There's always going to be something useful for a paladin to do. But the big advantage that Soren has from the BXP dump is he's overleveled compared to the enemies around him. If you wait to give him that BXP dump, then he's no longer going to be overleveled. He's just going to catch up to them. So if Soren wants an early BXP dump to be used, what justification does he give for that significant investment? Okay, so if we assume that good combat is a given on any unit who's BXP dumped in the early game, then Soren does still have two traits that are standout and potentially worth investing in him for. The first is staff access upon promotion, and the second is the ability to use siege tomes. The problem with this is Soren is not particularly adept at either of these roles. Let's start by looking at staffing. 
Due to just how bulky most of the player units in Path of Radiance are, I find that staffing is at best a niche role. As a result, I rarely need more than one staffer, and I don't think I've ever deployed more than two. And unfortunately for Soren, the game has two primary staffing units. Well, technically three, but I think it's safe to say that Soren is actually better than Alincia. Riss joins in Chapter 2, and his magic stat is kind of nutso. He has a base of 10 and the same 60% growth rate that Soren has, meaning that if they are the same level, he will always have a higher magic stat than Soren. And while it is true that Soren being able to do combat means that he gains experience faster unpromoted than Riss, both of these units are probably getting most of their level ups via bonus experience. A non BXP'd Soren is truly tragic. And not just because I think his combat is really bad at base, but because if the reason you are training Soren is to be a staff bot, you want him to gain staff access ASAP. Sages only get E staves in Path of Radiance, which means that if he wants to use any of the high level staffs, specifically Rescue and Physic, he is going to have to train his staff rank. Riss starts with D staves, and if for some reason he hasn't reached C by promotion, he will automatically get it upon becoming a bishop. Normally, I don't think a higher magic stat is a huge deal on a healer, but in the case of Path of Radiance, the two most important stats are Physic, whose range depends on your magic stat, and Rescue, whose range depends on your magic stat. In either case, given an equal amount of bonus experience, Riss will just have a longer range on both of them. And Rescue's range is relevant, because both Soren and Riss can be shoved in order to facilitate rescue strategies. One of the biggest examples is in the map Clash, wherein you can clear basically the entire map if you devote your flunkies to shoving either Riss or Soren, and then have them rescue your boss killer and Ike across to the seize point. But there are other advantages to having a large rescue staff, such as yoinking someone out of danger from halfway across the map, or sending them to the opposite end of the map. For example, in the mountains map, you kind of want to divide your army up, and if you need to bring someone from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, rescue staff can help you do that. But I would argue that beyond simply having a better magic rank, the biggest advantage that Riss has is he doesn't actually need bonus experience early on in order to be a good staff bot. If Soren wants to begin building his staff rank, then he's going to need one of the early dumps so that he can start spamming heal and then later mend and then eventually physic in order to reach rescue in a timely manner. Since Riss starts in a staff class, he's naturally going to be building upon his base D and will reach rescue in a timely manner regardless of whether or not you promote him. Personally, I find that he effortlessly reaches S rank staves long before you even have access to the Ashera staff, and that's without any amount of grinding or forethought put into it. This means that you can focus your early bonus experience on combat units, and then when you do desire a long range physic or rescue in the late game, you can dump all of your remaining BXP onto Riss in order to catch him up with the rest of your crew. This is nice because I find that aside from capping people for transfers, there's not really any other good use for late game bonus experience, so Riss has it basically uncontested. And promoting late doesn't even hurt his offensive weapon ranks, because light magic and staff rank are tied to each other. He will always have the same light rank in comparison to his staff rank. This isn't a huge deal because I think that Riss's combat is pretty mediocre anyway, but it's nice if you want to whip out Purge for the four chapters that it's available. The other primary competition that Soren has as a staffer is Mist. She joins later than Riss and has E rank staffs, but she has a trick up her sleeve. Instead of promoting to a magic user, she promotes to a Valkyrie. This does mean she has to use swords instead of magic, and she doesn't have a very good strength set, so her combat is kind of mediocre, but to be honest, both Riss and Soren have mediocre combat as well. The biggest benefit that Mist has is a horse. This means that she will keep up with the rest of the team on her own, and that's good because both Riss and Soren, and whatever other mages you're using, have armored movement, and so they're not going to be able to keep up with the team on their own. At least not without getting assistance by shoving or rescue dropping from other mounted units. 
Mist also technically has the benefit of being in the Black Knight boss fight and therefore making that easier, but that's not really a huge deal. The big selling point is that she has a horse. And look, I know there's going to be some number of people that cry elitist heresy at my emphasizing Mist's horse as being an upside over Soren, but it really is. Especially before he reaches Physic rank, if Soren wants to contribute at all, he's going to need to be ferried around by other units. And whether that's shove bots or rescue droppers, you are committing multiple units actions just to keep him on the front lines. Your army is already saddled with at least one infantry unit in the form of Ike. Every single one that you add on top of that is going to slow you down even more. And while I personally do not factor turns in when evaluating units, there are side objectives that it's easier to get if you move quickly, as well as some maps that have hard turn limits, or reinforcements coming in from behind that you can avoid if all of your units move quickly. It's also just really beneficial to be able to adapt to circumstances and move across the map quickly. His staff ranks will generally lag behind Riss and possibly even miss depending on how early he promotes, and both of those units also offer additional benefits on top of the extra staff rank that Soren cannot hope to match. Of course, this is another instance where Maniac Mode changes things. Having more than two staffers can actually be quite beneficial on Maniac Mode, both because enemies hit harder, and because going into the mid and late game, there are a plethora of status staves, and you want to have as many restore users as possible. This is probably the biggest benefit Soren has in Maniac Mode over his hard mode performance, although it is worth noting that you get much less bonus experience in Maniac Mode than you do hard mode, so it's going to be slower to promote Soren, and as a result slower to get him staves and build his staff rank to get Restore. In Path of Radiance, Restore is a C rank staff, same as Physic, so as a result you are going to want to staff grind in order to reach it by mid game. The other major benefit of a trained Soren is Siege Tomes. Path of Radiance is probably the mainline game that gives you the greatest access to multiple Siege Tomes, and that's pretty awesome for the units who can use it. Unfortunately, if you want to use more than one, you're going to have to train a different rank for each tome, because Bolting relies on C rank Thunder, Meteor relies on C rank Fire, and Blizzard relies on C rank Wind. Soren starts with E in both Fire and Thunder, although on promotion he is elevated to D in both ranks. He has D Wind, but he doesn't gain any Wind on promotion. So it's safe to assume that he's working from a starting point of D in all of his Anima ranks. In order to reach Seize Tomes, therefore, he only needs 40 weapon experience in whichever tome he chooses to focus on. This is by no means an insurmountable task, but it's also not a particularly quick one, especially if you are also working on building his staff rank. 40 rounds of combat with the same weapon type is more than it feels like. You do gain access to two arm scrolls, but arm scrolls will only affect one weapon rank, so it does give Soren free access to the Seize Tome of his choosing, but it doesn't give him access to all three of them. And this kinda sucks because Khalil, the pre-promoted sage who is not given staff access in order to nerf her, has the rank for all three siege tomes. And in fact, she arrives with Meteor in her inventory. You can get Bolting two chapters before Khalil joins, so there's a little bit of time for Soren to make exclusive use of siege tomes, but honestly, it's not that much. It feels pretty bad to squeeze the resource of bonus experience and the effort of grinding weapon ranks just to be met with a unit who can do the siege tome job arguably better than Soren. I say arguably better because at the same level, Soren will have higher magic than Khalil. Which is nice, it means he deals more damage than her. But for the most important siege tome jobs, Khalil's magic is actually more than enough. In my 0% growths playthrough, I had Bolting Khalil combine with Meteor Tormod at base in order to one round the boss of Solo, who is generally considered to be the most high impact use of Siege Tomes. Other common uses of Siege Tomes are killing Ballisticians on Chapter 23 The Great Bridge and Chapter 24 Battle Reunion. And in both of these instances, Khalil is more than suitable for the job. Don't get me wrong, it's never a bad thing to have access to Siege Tomes, 
but I don't think it justifies the heavy investment into Soren that is necessary in order to make him a competent combat unit with a bad move stat. Of course, there is one other potential benefit to Soren, and that is the fact that he can roll compress being a staffer and a siege tome user. Khalil might be a competent siege tomer for free, but she's never going to be able to heal her allies. Riss and Mist might be better staffers than Soren can ever dream to be, but the light magic siege tome doesn't arrive until the end of chapter 25 and Mist doesn't ever get access to a 310 range weapon. So if you want both of those roles and find that you don't have enough deployment slots for them, Soren can fit that bill, right? Well, there's two reasons that I don't think this is a compelling argument. The first is that Path of Radiance is a game where I find myself with excess deployment slots frequently. I often end up deploying units like Muaram and Mordecai just to use the smite command and then hang out near the start of the map. But even if I found myself struggling to field a full team, due to the way that bonus experience works in Path of Radiance, it's pretty easy for a unit to take several maps off and then come back roaring and ready to go. If the map I'm on doesn't really demand excessive staffing, then I can bench Riss and bring him back and not worry about him falling behind. Bonus experience will make up for any amount of experience he missed when he was on the bench. If there's not a good use for a Siege Tome on my current map, then Khalil can sit out and I can bring her back when I want to use her. As it stands, Soren's ability to perform two niche roles is just not something I find particularly valuable. The last unit deep dive that I did was about Sue from the Binding Plate, and at the end of the video I took a look at my FE6 tier list and moved Sue up based on everything that I had talked about with her. Well, the first tier list that I made for this channel was Path of Radiance, and on it I rated Soren quite low, in D tier as bad filler or very occasional utility. Having looked much closely, I do think I would move Soren up a little bit, but I don't think he escapes D tier. Instead, he ends up at the very top of it. So now he can go hang out with his boyfriend, and honestly, that's what Pride Month is all about, baby, so we should celebrate Soren staying in D tier rather than demand he move higher. That being said, if you're a huge fan of Soren, either as a character or a unit, feel free to use him. Every unit is usable in every Fire Emblem, but in a game as easy as Path of Radiance, then that goes doubly hard. As much as I talked about Soren's early contributions being a result of bonus experience rather than a result of Soren's inherent qualities, that's a double-edged sword. Yes, it means that Soren isn't a good unit for having good combat from being overleveled, but it also means that you can make anyone into a good unit by making them overleveled. Just power level Soren and watch him delete all of his foes before him. Or if you're not a fan of the Wind Mage, then apply this principle to whatever low tier Path of Radiance unit you love. Want to see a hungry girl kill everything? Give Ileana all of your bonus experience. A big fan of Mia's armpits, then give her all of your bonus experience. Personally, I love overinvesting in Rolf because he is one of, if not the worst units in the game, so it is incredibly funny to watch him just delete things and then not be useful on enemy phase, because there's some problems that even bonus experience can't solve. Pour one out for Rolf in the chat, folks. Pour one out for Rolf. And let's also pour one out for my patrons, but like in thanks and celebration instead of mourning. Uh, that, that's not a great transition, but I'll keep it. Fuck it. Thank you to all of my Patreon patrons. By which I mean Len, Carosa, Firent, Smaz Ruby, Saxon, Seraphie58, Reflect, Marin McLean, Calamity Callie, Queen Ellism, Adele, Michael Krause, Cynthia, Jamie Collins, Marin Karen, Thick Mulder, Danielle Kalaskis, Jagan is an S, Julia Kyoto, Arvis, Bell Wenska, Tailored Muffin, George Grenville the 7th PM, SUP, Caius Cole, Gabe the Green, Control Dages, Joanna the Wrenchwitz, Juniper Jungby, Ginger, Dysyke, Mean Jojo, and Autumn Kelsey. Your support is the reason I was able to make a 40 minute video, but a single character from a 20 year old video game. Truly wild times that we live in. If anyone else is interested in supporting the channel, there is a link to my Patreon below, which has a couple of benefits, like early videos, votes that affect what videos I make, and some benefits that are a bit too spicy to talk about on YouTube. But of course, please only donate if you can comfortably afford to do so. 
I don't want anyone going broke over Fire Emblem. If you can't afford the monthly subscription but still want to help me out, I would love it if you liked the video, but only if you actually enjoyed it. Subscribing will also let you see what I've got coming down the pipeline, but regardless of what you choose to do, I hope you have a wonderful day. Stay safe, gamers.